Welcome to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. And this is Chris in South London. Welcome to our second episode. How's it going, Chris? Hey, it's, it's, it's going good. It's going good. We, 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 yeah, um, yes, I, I think we're, hopefully we're kind of getting more into the flow of things. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's good to have got another Doctor Who book out the way. Indeed. Uh, this is the second episode where in a moment we'll be recapping and reviewing Gary Russell's uh, 12th Doctor novel, Big Bang Generation. Note the uh, lack of definitive article in the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but first we wanted to maybe start a new segment called What's New? We have, we don't have a good title for it yet, but <laughs> what's what's new since we last chatted uh, yes. in the past month? I've got a couple of things to, to talk about Um one is that I bought a 3D TV, which are, mm-hmm. I guess, on the way out. Um, they aren't being made anymore in 2017. So yeah. I found a 2016 model kind of on discount, and it was that little sweet spot where um, it does both 4K and 3D. So I've been going mm-hmm. a little bit nuts in buying 3D <laughs> movies. Um, and to tie it into Doctor Who, the uh, 50th anniversary, of course, mm. um, it looks really good. The the 3D nowadays is much better than uh, what it was in when when this whole thing launched with active shutter glasses and stuff. Now it's it's pretty much just as you see it in the theater. And the uh, Dark Water, Death in Heaven looks pretty good too, even though that one I think was um, post converted. Yeah, but yeah. super super excited about that. So I've been getting a lot of. Uh, old movies that were shot in 3d like in the 50s and 60s and uh 80s which which have been uh pretty fun to watch um another new item in this past month i picked up the uh hartnell uh reprints so Mm. the first three uh william hartnell stories were released as um hardcover reprints using the original artwork from the pre um target novelization days uh, they look absolutely gorgeous, so uh, mm. I was glad to pick those up. And then the uh, third item that I'm excited about, uh, besides Doctor Who coming back uh, <laughs> soon, is uh, there was a Kickstarter announced for uh, Riff Track. So those are the uh, one of the teams that do uh, Mystery Science Theater yeah. 3000. Uh, they announced that they're going to be uh, riffing the five Doctors in a... Uh, worldwide kind of uh well i don't know if it's worldwide but at least in the united states yeah. um tickets go on sale april 14th so just as this podcast is um posting i think through mm-hmm. fathom events and it's going to be broadcast live um on august 17th which is a uh, thursday evening and the rebroadcast will be august 24th also a thursday and they've mm-hmm. uh previously riffed both of the peter cushing dalek movies uh which are a lot of fun to uh it's an interesting way to experience them let's say that <laughs> yeah and i think the five doctors is very riff trackable oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> for more on the five doctors listen to our previous episode um how, how about you chris what's uh new and exciting so um what well, we have we, we have new doctor who uh and i remember the 90s so it's always nice to be in a month in which there is new doctor who coming out <laughs> i remember years in which there wasn't any new doctor who content on the tv um and uh, and kind of the also um our understanding uh, um and sort of we a little bit of inside baseball uh we're recording this a little bit in advance but there was kind of news that um that will particularly be of um relevance to some of our discussions last week well last week last month um in that um bill our new companion is gay. Oh, I didn't know yes. that. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, I heard so, it here first. <laughs> yeah, and, and apparently it's made um, uh, quite clear in her second line of dialogue. Oh. Uh, and uh, and this was this was uh, sort of um, announced by the beat. It was obviously they did a press screening or something. Uh, they're, they're prone to do these things, you know, for about um, sort of two to three weeks out. And uh, uh, yeah. I think it's wonderful. It's really good. Um, so uh, yeah, um, uh, 
Yeah, let, let, let's hope that Bill is a good companion that nobody gets annoyed about because he'll be a shame. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, this is a hostage to fortune, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, so oh, that's that's really cool. I hadn't heard yeah. of it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, um, I, I, I saw that on my phone this morning when I woke up, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. Right, well, we're going to try and squeeze that into the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really cool. And uh, there's the book we're reading for this month, too. Benny's uh, Son, I believe. Yes, yep. yes, yes, um, yes. And kind of speaking of, uh, so our book this month is Big Bang Generation. And before we get into the plot of it, I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, Gary Russell and some of the other work that, that he's done over the years. Um, I had first met Gary back in 1999 at, um, a regional science fiction convention that I've been involved with, uh, for several years here in Minneapolis called Convergence. Um, and at that convention, he had launched, uh, the big finish Doctor Who audios. He had the first episode of Sirens of Time about, I want to say two or three months before it, um, debuted. So we all got to, to hear it. Evil and Smythe was created at that convention in the, uh, hot tub <laughs> as as a bunch of fans <laughs> uh I, I wasn't i wasn't present for for that but uh <laughs> you can you can read a little bit about the, that story in um the acknowledgements of i think it was uh the ninth big finish her second story uh specter of lanyon moore they okay. talk a little bit about that uh fans who have gone on to be authors like Catherine sullivan and, and some of some other folks were uh, involved in that conversation. And I think it started out as how do we get uh, the sixth doctor from how he appeared in the previous season to how he appears in trial of the time Lord. And, and the idea was to uh, feed him lots of chocolate cake <laughs> from, <laughs> from, from, from Evelyn. And, uh, and that was kind of how she uh, started and they wanted to go with the, an older companion too. But uh, it's funny every time I go back to the, that convention, I think of uh evil in a little bit <laughs> in that conversation. Um, yeah. Gary's done a lot of work. He's done some nonfiction work, including a book about the eighth doctor TV movie called regenerations. He's written for, uh, the radio times, eighth doctor comics. He edited, uh, doctor who magazine for a stint. And he was, uh, really the showrunner for big finish for the first hundred releases or so before, um, Nick Briggs took over. And I think, I think I had mentioned last month that I re I've read uh, Invasion of the Cat People, uh, Legacy, or is not a realization of the Eighth Doctor TV movie, um, and of course, most of his um, big finish output. In fact, I, th I think my first work that I experienced of Gary's was his uh, Destiny of the Doctors uh, computer game back in uh, 1997, which he wrote. Mm. And then Fancy he... Ainley's final contribution to, um, um, to the franchise. Yes, yep. And I think you can see those video clips on uh, the DVD of Survival, as mm. uh, I think they're the special feature there. He also uh, worked on Sarah Jane Adventures and Torchwood mm. and um, directed the two animated Doctor Who um, episodes, uh, Infinite Quest and Dreamland with, mm -hmm. uh, with David Tennant and, of course, the excellent uh, Gallifrey Audios. Uh, which of you haven't heard, um, there's one series of that which features an evil version of the first Romana played by Mary Tam <laughs> pitted against <laughs> uh, against the second Romana played by Lala Ward. And it's just it's just exquisite. It's it's like Dallas or Dynasty levels of uh, <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of fighting. Um, it, it's, it's really fun. One time, I think it was at an LGBT uh, science fiction convention called Galaxicon. I had asked uh, Gary because I was trying to understand how he exactly worked on Sarah Jane Adventures, I asked him what his biggest contribution to that show was. And he said it was uh, getting Nicholas Courtney to appear in season two. And he said that had he not been in his role, that um, appearance likely would not have happened. His, Nick Courtney's final appearance to uh, to thank him yeah. for as well. So uh, Gary's, uh, shall we say, been involved with uh, Doctor Who on and off over the years quite uh, mm. quite extensively. Uh, I first encountered his work um, when he was a child actor. Oh. Uh, is, uh, he was uh, in um, in the Famous Five, um, and uh, uh, which 
I, I don't know how familiar that franchise, for want of a better word, is in the States. But it's one of these things that's kind of drilled into um, into British, particularly English children. Um, and uh, and yeah, and he 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 was he he played. I think it was Julian. I think maybe anyway. Anyway, he he was one of the kids in that. Um, and uh, and also he was as well as the editor of Doctor Who magazine. He was the um, the reviewer um, for, um, for 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 many years. Uh, and uh, I remember um, one of his comments um, because he, he his review of the book of uh, Remembrance of the Daleks, and uh, he he sort of said that um, uh, there's um, that there was somebody who um, who read um, some of his Doctor Who books uh, on the slides, so this was the first one that felt like an actual novel, and I kind of imagined this being like, like a Mrs. Hudson figure. Um, um, sort of uh, reading books, which I think sort of probably says more about sort of my ten-year-old self. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be natural for there to be a landlady figure who will read the books. Yes, yeah, we um, yeah, the, the famous five isn't isn't very well isn't very famous in America, but we have our um kind of literary equivalents. I think for American listeners, it would be similar to like the Bobsy twins or the boxcar children um those sorts of books where you have young groups of teenage kids solving mysteries mm, mm. i'd say hardy boys oh yeah uh, but yeah. possibly not possibly not quite <laughs> not quite as gritty as the hardy boys not that the hardy boys did gritty anyway, anyway we are digressing wildly yes. um and uh, yes but uh, yes gary russell top bloke and those are stuff and we're re- kind of returning to this the setting of the book um yes Gary Russell lived in Australia for a couple of years um, mm. when he, when he wrote this. And by the way, there's a there's an end note in the book for our, for our listeners. The book has 14 chapters and an end note. And the end note, which kind of Gary describes how the book came about, isn't included in the audio. So I had mm. happened to have the paperback as well, and I kind of flipped between the two throughout as I was checking like pronunciations and and spellings. Mm. He lived in Australia for a couple of years. He worked with a an animation company down there called Planet 55 Studios on a 26-part animated series, which is currently airing on ABC3 called Prisoner Zero. Um, I wonder where they got <laughs> that, that title from. That um, familiar. <laughs> and uh, I think he first started working with Planet 55 in his role with Big Finisher with the BBC. They had done the animated reconstructions for the moon base in the 10th planet. Um, and I think they were working on the underwater menace when they got the call for their, their pickup for uh, prisoner zero. And that may be why the uh, uh, animation was abandoned on that release. And uh, they uh, ended up going with the telesnap reconstruction mm-hmm. to get that one out the door before uh, DVD was gone entirely. And I think too, with this book, we should mention that it's loosely related to an earlier book that Kerry Russell did called um, The Glamour Chase with the 11th Doctor. And it's also loosely part of a, it's part two of a three-part 12th Doctor trilogy called The Glamour Chronicles, um, which in turn is based on concepts first introduced in a uh, 10th Doctor and Donna story called Ghosts of India by Mark Morris. So uh, it's kind of like a sequel (laughs) within a sequel (laughs) within a trilogy. But also though, um, without wanting to jump too far ahead, I mean it, it can be enjoyed on its own merit. Um, is I quickly realised I didn't have to kind of do a lot of um, uh, Wikipedia diving to figure out what happened in in previous stories. It does feel very very standalone um, mm. in in that sense, and I I think the um, the glamour, which when we get into the plot, kind of acts as almost like a MacGuffin. It could, <laughs> or or, <Almost>. it, or is. <laughs> um, it's the most McGuffney McGuffney. Yeah, it could have could have been anything. Um, yes. So it's very very loosely tied to those earlier um, books. And then the other thing, just a couple of other things to mention before we get into the plot. Um, the uh, book title is so Big Bang Generation. It's uh, the title of a Duran Duran song, which ah. is which is on their 1997 Madazaland album which also gets name checked in the book. And yeah. um, I don't think this is the first time Gary's done this where he's used uh, like new wave songs or lyrics in his, uh, in his chapter titles. Mm-hmm. Um, but every single chapter title in this book is uh, based on a Duran Duran song or an album title. Okay. A couple of the locations are named after 
Duran Duran side projects. So we'll get to a, a building called the Power Station, which is right. a, which is a eighty <laughs> super group. And then the name of the art, the name of the hotel in the book is called Arcadia, which mm. um, isn't named after Gallifrey's second city, but is named after uh, another spinoff group from Duran Duran in the eighties called Arcadia. It also does feel like the sort of name that a hotel in Sydney would have. It does. Um, yes. <laughs> so it may, it may very well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, by the way, Australian listeners, brace yourself. This one's going to be partially set in Sydney. Um, yeah. so, as we kind of alluded to. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And the other the other thing I just wanted to mention real quick is this book is on the shorter side, too. It's, um, yes. The, the audio narration ended up being... Um, about five and a half hours. And to give you a comparison, uh, James Goss's recent uh, Douglas Adams City of Death, that was close to, to 10 hours. And Ghost Light, which is a target novelization, is uh, just under seven hours in length. So it's um, it's pretty short. Yeah. All right. So shall we... Uh, shall we begin? Yeah, let's begin. Let's begin. Um, so uh, we... We start off with, um, with with a little bit of a cryptic conversation between two women. Um, I'm curious as to how this plays out on the audio, <laughs> um, but because uh, you have two women speaking to each other without much in the way of description, and there's some references to sending postcards to lure an unnamed man, um, and uh, and they're going like, well, this is going to be the Doctor, isn't it? Uh, and uh, on the in in, in the book version uh, one of the women is from the future and speaks in italics uh, which is um, helpful um, and so she transfers a rock to the woman from the past um, how do they do this in the audio uh just by benny talking to herself really it, it makes yes. it, it makes it seem pretty um clear who's who's speaking just if, okay. if, you've, if you've had any um exposure to lisa bowerman's performance as benny before um mm. it, it makes it somewhat clear what's what's going on but that is nice that one side of the conversations in italics because that did get mm. pretty confusing um, <laughs> the uh yeah. the the older benny from the future is kind of outlining like hey something big is about to happen to you and narration outlines out like six different timelines where mm. or time frames i should say where where the story is happening so yes. we have prehistoric times which i think is 36,000 BC yeah. which i had to look up i didn't realize that um aboriginal uh the people in in australia had migrated something like 50,000 years before a lot earlier than i than i had thought um then this next time frame is in chronological order is a uh, 1934 where you have a German archaeologist and his family mm -hmm. arriving by boat to Australia. Then there's a little bit of a side quest where we get three different postcards, <laughs> one, <laughs> one, one from 1969, one from 1991 and one from 2001. So yeah. put a pin in, in that. <laughs> and then we yes. have uh, 2015, in Sydney, Australia, where the majority of the book takes place. Mm -hmm. Then we have a reference to uh, the 27th century, so the 2600s, and the planet of uh, Legion, where uh, Benny is is living with her son. And that's where um, the the younger version of Benny in, in Chapter 1, that's kind of where the, the story begins. Then there's an off reference to the 36th century, which... Um, there's a group studying or arguing about the the glamour which um mm. was kind of a one off and it never came back in the novel so i'm wondering if that's a tie in to one of the other books perhaps in the in the trilogy and then the final time frame we get is uh in 5066 um which is kind of river, river songs era where you get the uh the church of the papal mainframe so all of that is outlined in the first chapter <laughs> <laughs> mm. And uh, in the um, it, 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 in the bit in Rivers' time, um, we see that um, at Storm Cage um, number one, someone's turning down an application to borrow River Song, um, which is a little bit of an allusion to um, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff in the book, because apparently Gary Russell had originally intended to use River and was told uh, that. Uh, no, they had other plans, um, which was um, which went on to become the 2015 Christmas special. Uh, 
There's also a sneaky little reference to um, in this section, I think, to Sky Ray lollies. Because um, that bit under 36th um, century or whatever it was, um, I, I think it was there. It was like one of these sections. Um, people are talking about the kind of like the um, the great writings of the Sky Ray lollies, um, uh, which is um, um, which can only be a reference to um, um, to a, a series of lollies uh, in the UK in the 70s and stuff that had um, comic strips and the like. Uh, so <laughs> in the uh, I think it's in more than 30 years in the TARDIS, you get a couple of the uh, commercials for those Sky Ray lollies featuring a, a different actor playing uh, the second doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and then in that same paragraph, he name checks a bunch of unofficial Doctor Who publishing houses too, like uh, Mwick Publishing, which I think did the, the biography of John Nathan Turner. And then he also references the Obverse um, Publishing, which uh, has been putting out the uh, Iris Wildtime uh, books too. So then, once once we have that conversation with with the Doctor and Benny, or sorry, Benny and Benny. Yes, <laughs> no, Benny and Benny. Not, not the Doctor <laughs> yeah. and Benny. Uh, once we have the conversation with Benny and Benny, we cut to uh, the Doctor meeting uh, Carrie the Packar. Uh, yes, who's a uh, about a four foot tall kind of hamster guinea pig looking uh, reporter who um, yes. I was first introduced to Carrie in a Big Finish's first subscriber exclusive before they even got the Doctor Who license. They did a um, audio with Benny called Short Trip or not Short Trips, uh, Buried Treasures, where they had two short stories, one of which featured Carrie the the Packar, and that's that was my first experience. Uh, with Carrie, and then um, shortly after that, I read her uh, appearance in uh, Legacy, where she meets Benny for the first time on uh, Peladon. Carrie, the, the, there's two, there's two interesting observations. So at one point, she's actually referred to as Carrie Packer, not Carrie the Packer, uh, at least in in my ebook version. There is a <laughs> there's there's an Australian media figure called Carrie Packer. I guess that the pun is deliberate. Um, um, so he's kind of like, um, I was going to say like an Australian version of Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is an Australian version of Rupert Murdoch. But Kerry Packer didn't really kind of travel in quite such a way. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, uh, Aussie listeners again, there'll be a few little references for you later i seem to remember from about the time of kind of legacy that gary russell had said that kerry was based on a friend of his oh. um uh so uh, yeah yeah bear that in mind as we go on um <laughs> but... <laughs> so they're on the on the planet and yeah. i should mention the planet legion is kind of a backwater planet it has a very slow rotation so it has mm. a dark side and light side to the planet Carrie's leg is broken from ice skating and she's showing the doctor these three postcards. Um, and one, I think the one from 1969 referenced tea with Charlie, but I <laughs> couldn't tell who, which Charlie that was, if it was supposed to be uh, Charlotte Par Pollard or um, someone else. I, I wondered whether it was supposed to be Prince Charles. Oh, I wondered. Uh, I don't know, um, but uh, on the on on the ice skating um, thing, uh, there's an excruciating pun um, that's really really laboured. Uh, so because so basically, it's it's a living ice planet where she has her accident. That the doctor is called Torval and Dean, uh, which and Torval and Dean are a pair of Olympic ice skaters. Um, and sort of they are um, probably one of you know, the great British Winter Olympians uh, and that pun it's hinted at it's then explained in depth and it's like oh right okay we're labouring this one to death um, yeah. <laughs> yes sorry <laughs> um, the, so the the postcards uh, yes. the, doc the doctor didn't send them um, he's a little bit perplexed by them. Um, there's a reference to a an adventure that Carrie has with uh, Sarah Jane and Luke from the Sarah Jane Adventures. I'm not sure if that was um, an adventure we've seen or or heard reference to. I, I can imagine it's an off screen one because um, yeah. I don't think the Sarah Jane Adventures had the budget for a four foot tall hamster. <laughs> <laughs> 
we we later learned by the way um and i didn't know this at the time that the bar that they're in uh kind of a dive bar uh, called the white rabbit is owned by um the doctor's brother uh irving braxiatel mm. and he's absent throughout the entire story but there are a couple of references um to him and that that he owns the the bar later on um is he named He's he's hinted at a lot, but I, I can't remember what he's actually named. They start saying his name, they start saying Irving, and they get the IRV out, and then they're cut off. Yeah, so I always wonder whether there's some kind of, uh, of, of licensing thing <laughs> or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. They it, it's made a so there's a whole series of audios. There's a Legion box set where Benny and her team that were introduced to in this book. Mm. Um, where where Irving is in those audios and he's he is the owner of the the White Rabbit, but um yeah it's interesting that they don't explicitly say that here and maybe it's because they don't want to go down the whole Doctor extended family route in the uh, yeah in the officially licensed stuff it's hard to say so then we cut to um, we jump in the future where we're following um, the uh, kind of the trials and tribulations of uh, Cirrus Glob who's a uh, He's a human grifter from the. Um, not sure where exactly he's from. There's they make reference to a human colony uh, called El Diablo. Mm -hmm. um, there's a woman named Kick the Assassin who's a Spyro. She has a silver mohawk. She is a kind of a turquoise reptile with hollow uh, telescopic bones, and so mm -hmm. she can kind of stretch her limbs like, uh, I guess, like Dalsam from Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was kind of picturing um, Ventress from Star Wars: The Clone Wars, or if listeners who grew up in the '80s might remember uh, Huntera, she she had a white mohawk on a uh, Shira. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Storm, Storm, or Storm. From the, yeah, from Storm from the too. late '80s, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. yeah late '80s X Men. Kick is yeah. a uh, self-described weaponista assassin who uh, mm. knows how to use weapons, and she has a contract on Cirrus and. She's trying to uh, kill him, but the papal mainframe uh, intervenes and stops her attempt on his life. He ends up getting sentenced to life in prison. Uh, kick only three months because she they didn't, they didn't they didn't catch on that she was an assassin. It uh, took her about two years to track him down, and uh, they were they're placed in a, in adjoining cells in a, a storm cage facility <laughs> where they're delivered letters. And released by their cells, their guards having been paid off by a headless monk, um, who who we've seen in the uh, the new series, mm -hmm. and uh, the letters inform them that they have to work together and go to a planet called Aztec Moon to uh, steal something. Yes, yes, steal an artifact from another wing of the church, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, and so we then go on to um, to Aztec Moon. Is Aztec Moon a Duran Duran song? I'm not sure if it is or not. <laughs> okay. I, I know that. Uh, so this one also has a uh, instead of a light side and a dark side, this one has a uh, wet side and a dry side. Mm. So a, yeah. a side that rains all the time and a side that doesn't. Um, I'm not sure that weather really works that way, but <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it is it is interesting. And there's a uh, there's a giant alien black pyramid named mm. the, named the pyramid eternia which uh gets discovered on aztec moon um which has a time portal inside of it and that's where the uh older benny was speaking to the um younger benny in the first uh in the first chapter we're uh introduced to a group on aztec moon and i i was kind of thinking of the the team from tomb of the cybermen where you have some of them kind of military, some of them not military, and they're looking for the archaeologist that they had booked, River Song, but she's interned at Storm Cage, and her request to be let out was denied. Yes. <laughs> so a little bit of meta there going on again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, uh, in, in this kind of group, we have um, a Professor Horace Janssen, um, who um, likes to wear tweed and is described as looking like something from the aristocracy planets, um, which is it's nice that the aristocracy have planets of their own, isn't it? Um, Aztec Moon itself, I mean, it's described at one point as being like a, as having like a red rock. 
and it almost feels like if this was a TV episode, this would be filmed in Australia with the Aztec moon bits as well, um, using kind of like the red soil, uh, as, you know, as well as obviously the other, you know, the blatantly Australian bits. Um, but yeah, it, it, in, in the same way that um, the you know, planet of fire has uh, Lanzarote and an alien planet looking not unlike Lanzarote. Uh, so, um, but yeah, because I, I do get like a, a Christmas special vibe from mm. this. Yeah. Um, um, the, mil- <laughs> the, the military is from a, is from mm. the church of the papal mainframe and is similar to the group of soldiers that we see in uh time of angels and flesh and stone and um, Octavian uh, who is from time of angels and is rivers uh, kind of church handler. Um, he gets, he gets a mention uh, in this as well. Um, and so rather than river meeting up with them, uh, Benny <laughs> kind of <laughs> waltzes up and says, Hey, I'm an archeologist, but probably not the one you were expecting. <laughs> So we, we get that uh, nice tie back to uh, uh, Night of the Doctor. Yes. Um, so everyone's looking for the glamour, which is this mm-hmm. stone or, or rock. Um, I don't think they ever settle on a name for it <laughs> in yeah. the entire book. Uh, we cut back to uh, Legion in the 27th century where an upright pink crocodile alien hatch- <laughs> uh, <laughs> this This upright pink crocodile alien hatchling uh, takes the doctor's sonic <laughs> from yes. him and uh yeah. the doctor gives up his sonic to av- avoid a fight and we get a nice little bit where the the doctor acknowledges that the tardis could just grow him a uh new sonic mm. and the doctor and carrie start tracking the uh the sonic but they get a text telling them to uh head to sydney in 2015 instead yeah he's also um it it says here that um that Legion is the kind of place that he wouldn't have visited um, three or four regenerations ago because he wouldn't have dared, which, uh, well, yeah, I suppose the ninth didn't really go too far from Earth on TV. Uh, And it also explicitly says that he has an urge to avoid retreading adventures from his fourth and fifth incarnations. That's a sensible policy, I think. <laughs> I think so, yes. Because, uh, let's put it this way. <laughs> yeah, the four, four, Adventures of the Fourth, those have been retread quite a few times. He also has a job loss of um, of kind of cell slash mobile phones um, from a man in Houston. Um, I don't know quite who that man is, but uh, yeah, those those sort of cell mobile phones, um, those, those become a little bit relevant later on. Yep. Um and at this point, too, we're introduced to Benny's team. So mm. I, I wasn't super familiar with any of them because I'm pretty familiar with Benny up until the point where she gets married. And then after that, she has a whole series of adventures in books and audios that I've read summaries about on Wikipedia, but I'm not super <laughs> super familiar with. So Benny has a son named Peter who's a half-human teenager, half is described as almost like Rottweiler. Yeah. yeah, as we mentioned earlier, he's gay. He's in charge of security on on Legion. I was kind of picturing um, Channing Tatum's character in Jupiter Ascending. I don't know if you've seen that, but he's like a half no. half werewolf kind of character with uh, pointed ears and and teeth. So we're introduced to Peter. We're introduced to Ruth and Jack, who are a couple. Ruth is in early twenties. She's described as a spoiled princess type, so it's kind of getting like a like a Nissa vibe from her almost, mm. but her mind was wiped, so she did, she uh, in a in a previous adventure, so she doesn't really have uh, uh memories about that. Um and then uh her uh fiance is Jack, sometimes goes by Spring Hill Jack, which was uh mm. the name of a um serial killer, not unlike uh Jack the Ripper. I don't know if the Spring Hill Jack was necessarily a serial killer, but he was certainly it was certainly this this thing that there were um, that there were kind of sightings of uh, in Victorian times, uh, and as recently as I think the forties up around Liverpool way, um, showing Liverpool. Yes. Anyway, I won't go there. I was going to say something, but uh, our, our Merseyside audience might be rude. Yeah. So Spring Hill Jack is a thing in in kind of British Victorian mythology. Um, he he looks human somewhat mm. uh, you know fate you might not clock that he's a an alien but he has a 
I guess grasshopper like legs. So you mm. he does jump about quite a bit, um, kind of Linda Carter, Wonder Woman style. <laughs> yes, he also had he also has glowing red eyes, which is another thing that Spring Hill Jack had. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, Spring Hill Jack was a kind of a, an obsession of mine about ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we learn that uh, Spring Hill Jack was the one who sent the uh, the postcards earlier, um, not the Doctor. Uh, and as, as we mentioned, he's he's engaged to uh, Ruth. Their their team almost reminded me. I was getting very much like a, almost like a Sarah Jane Adventures vibe, where you had Benny in the Sarah Jane role as kind of like the mother figure to these three, and they're mm-hmm. off doing adventures. Um, that dynamic, at least to me, seemed very similar bet- between the two groups. Yeah, I can see. I can see that. Um, uh, I I was also getting a bit of a vibe of kind of like a um, like a Marvel Comics crossover, um, where you're kind of being introduced to these various characters and like, yeah, okay, no, I don't read this comic. I've got no idea who all of these people are. Thank you for that. This sounds very strange. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think it, it's quite hard to do because like to introduce the backstory as because you have to kind of rush through because quite a few people will have no idea who benny is let alone uh her um, her current supporting cast yep. uh, but uh yeah so the benny and her team they were summoned there um again so this is the they were summoned ahead tw- 20 centuries to uh rivers era by finding a uh a chip of the the glamour um they think it's a fragment of it uh we later learn that it's not in fact a chip but it's a time echo i don't know i think that might be a distinction without a difference (laughs) (laughs) but regardless of what it is they they had dug it up on legion and um uh, more on that later uh they, they had dug it up on legion and that caused them to jump ahead um the 20 centuries to the pyramid eternia we should mention too that this lodestone or the glamour is really functions as a um as a key to the pyramid eternia so it's um, mm. inexorably kind of tied to the pyramid which is why it keeps coming up again and again kick and glob show up mm. um and benny's group uses a similar style of uh sleeping patch clara used against the or tried to use against the doctor in a uh, dark water a uh, similar sort of thing to put the group to sleep. Peter, uh, Benny's son, he goes off to track Glob and Kick, who are meeting uh, Professor Horace uh, Jansen or Jansen, who are also trying to find the find the glamour, as we talked about. And uh, Benny has a bit of a reminisce about her her travels with the Doctor, and then she's confronted by Kick, and then it, the the book kind of went into this weird. Thing where they started quoting an unearthly child <laughs> back and forth <laughs> to each other <laughs> and that and i don't think the the aired version but the pilot version <laughs> i think nice of that. yeah where they just talk about being born in another time in another world oh, and yeah yeah that whole exchange was kind of i found that odd <laughs> well benny's also coming off quite doctory at points um sort of particularly when she's kind of confronting the um uh, the church here um there's also we're also explicitly told that she still looks to be in her mid 30s despite the fact that her real life uh, yeah her her real age would be kind of 50s and that's because of the effects of tardis travel and there's this kind of implication that maybe age might catch up with her quickly and violently um uh, which is kind of nice because one of the things i because I didn't know whether or not the Big Finish audios with Benny and her crew were still ongoing. So I didn't quite necessarily... Because uh, whilst I was reading this, I was kind of thinking, yeah, if these were standalone characters that weren't in someone else's um, kind of like um, toy toy box, this may well lead to something. But kind of conscious of the fact that things might need to be reset a bit, uh, I, I was kind of like, hmm, okay they they in kind of compressing stuff here a little bit they they find their way into the pyramid the pyramid vanishes mm-hmm. ca- causing most of the military folks that are outside the pyramid to to fall uh into the hole where the, the pyramid <laughs> yeah. was left and they they all die yeah and in the pyramid as well there's there's a whirlpool which there are kind of future versions of benny and her team uh and uh and the 
and the future selves also at one point their clothes also sort of like change by magic um and uh, then we're kind of told oh this must be where the future selves do the postcard sending um so yeah it, it's it's really quite timey-wimey yeah. um, and then we cut to planet earth sydney uh new south wales australia <laughs> yes in, in, in 2015 um the doctor runs into ruth and peter christmas is in full swing so that means it's sweltering out and it's full summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we get into quite a critique about um, about kind of australian christmases and the fact that it's all revolving around wintry things and yeah he's not wrong i've i've spent i i i've spent christmas in australia it's weird sorry australians um <laughs> so there's not been any effort to adapt um so you see you see these choristers wandering around in their kind of fur coats and stuff and just go yeah this is bizarre why why are you doing it this way uh also um this first encounter is in a gift shop i think it's fair to say we don't go too far outside of the tourist trail in uh, in in sydney and new south wales as a whole uh so uh yeah if you're if you're expecting some kind of hard-hitting expose of what it's like to live in sydney this is not your book yeah that's that's a good point <laughs> gary, gary does show off quite a bit of local knowledge but it is is somewhat confined to uh to the the more mainstream kind of touristy areas but he, he does yeah. offer quite a bit of commentary on what he thinks of like how the tree leaves look <laughs> And, <laughs> and whether or not they catch rain and, and interesting things like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, also, um, so it, so when he's encountering Ruth and Pete in, in the gift shop, um, uh, Ruth claims to be from working class London, um, which is quite a nice little gag because Benny has been doing that for years, um, going all the way back to uh, Love and War, mm-hmm. um, where she greets Ace with, was it? Cool, blimey, love a duck. Um, <laughs> so it's nice that Ruth is learning from uh, from Benny. Um, also, um, the Doctor is being observed by um, by an Indigenous Australian in a white shirt and chinos who um, will keep on popping up from time to time in a mysterious way. They go to, I guess Sydney also has a version of the White Rabbit which mm. presumably is also owned by uh, Braxiatel. It's a kind of a dilapidated uh, shop that's covered in a perception filter, referred to as a as a shimmer almost, to, to make it look like uh, something that it's not. And that's where the uh, the doctor is is meeting these. They they kind of go to a cafe, and then um, the the pier, a pyramid appears in Sydney Harbor, causing the crowd to start running away from it in in shock and the doctor of course runs to the pyramid and someone else is running to the pyramid but is slightly in front of him and pulls his hand to help him through the crowd and of course it's benny and the 12th doctor and benny get to meet for the uh Mm. the first time um she remarks here that last time she saw him he was younger shorter and scottish does this contradict the dying days or or perhaps or, she's... Or, or McCoy, yeah, maybe they've they maybe they've met out of sync, and we're also told that um, that Jack um, is kind of being perfectly charming and sort of indicative of his species, and apparently is the reason why so many of his species work in the law, accounting, and IT. Um, which I go, like, yeah, that's flattering the audience, isn't it? <laughs> um, I work in IT. I don't know if I necessarily describe. <laughs> I was going to say, and I work in law, and I, I would I would have the same uh, the same opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I'm like, really? Okay, okay, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, we yeah we need to go and work wherever Gary has uh, has had these encounters in the past. <laughs> When we first, just jumping back a little bit, but when we first meet the doctor, he's reading uh, one of the uh, Wizard of Oz books, which Mm. if you've heard Gary talk at conventions, he's an Oz fan. And I think that was one of the ranges he he kept pitching to a big finish to do an adaptation of all the L. Frank Baum books. So he's Mm a, it was, I found it kind of interesting that he had uh, the doctor reading (laughs) an Oz book in his, in his spare time. So that kind of, brings us to the as they're looking at the pyramid uh mm. they're captured by glob and kick who have traveled back in time 
uh, along yeah. with with them and professor jansen as well is uh um and uh and so because every said the, the pyramid is actually kind of it's in sydney harbour quite close to the bridge so uh, which is convenient for the cover uh and uh is, is also again we're very touristy in this book mm-hmm. um and we also have a little cutaway with a cop talking to a wino called Jared about the pyramid in a scene that is just, <laughs> it, that feels like padding, to be fair. Uh, this cop does rock up again later, and he never does anything particularly exciting and relevant, but uh, anyway. <laughs> the Benny and team and Glob and Kick are kind of making their way back to the mm. back to the harbour near, near the opera house. And Benny and the doctor have a bit of an exposition uh, con- conversation. This brings us to our dramatic reading for the month, mm. where we pick up on a conversation that the doctor and Benny are having about their present situation. We'll be playing a uh, very short excerpt from the BBC audiobook, utilized under fair use for review purposes. The BBC audiobook narrations, if you haven't heard them, have uh, music and sound effects to help kind of round out the the listening experience. And the we should mention too that the Big Bang Generation audiobook is available wherever audiobooks are sold, including on CD, iTunes, and other download services, and may also be available as a streaming selection on Audible. Lisa Bowerman, the uh, voice of Benny herself here since 1998, provides the narration this month. Let's have a listen. The doctor just stared at her, closed his eyes, took a deep breath opened them again and looked at her without smiling. I liked you in the 27th century, he said. I feel safe with you in the 27th century. I don't go to the 27th century anymore. Bernice just beeped his nose. You miss me. Now tell me how this pyramid is going to blow up the universe. Oh, that's simple, he said, carefully wiping the end of his nose where Bernice had beeped him. The ancients of the universe manipulated all of time and space for their own ends, then vanished, leaving their famous Pyramid Eternia to be stayed away from. The youngest time tot on Gallifrey learnt that, because what you are referring to as a lodestone, what others called the glamour or the stone of destiny, is an incredibly powerful key. And what do keys do? Lock things up? leaving them safe or unlock things leaving them unsafe especially if you remove the key so imagine that by taking that key away inch by inch or rather microsecond by microsecond what you were opening was a portal to all of space and time when it comes crashing through it reverberates throughout all of space and time and And, Professor, as each bit of space and time touches another piece of space and time it wasn't supposed to touch, they annihilate one another. And in the space of about three heartbeats, past, present and future are nullified. The Big Bang never happened. And yet, at the same time, it happens in every microsecond like a chain reaction. The universe is... What's the phrase I was looking for? Oh, yes... Gone. Then we need to stop Glob and Jansen or whoever getting into the pyramid and steeding your key, Bernice realised. Which, of course, we already did. But it wasn't the real key, it was a temporal echo. And the real key is here, and the Pyramid Eternia has come back looking for the key, and we need to place the real key in the place of the echo key and stop the universe going bang. Spot on. Why here? Why now? I mean... What's so special about the key in 2015? The doctor shrugged. Haven't the foggiest? Well, then you're a fat lot of good, Bernice said. We need to find someone who does know. She looked at Professor Horace Jansen. If he knew, the doctor said, he'd already have it in his hands. But what Horace Jansen actually knows about anything can be written on the back of a postage stamp. We need access to the repository of all knowledge. The Matrix on Gallifrey. The doctor opened his mouth to speak, but didn't. Bernice reached out, took his hand. I'm sorry, what did I say? Gallifrey is... The doctor tried to find the right word. Missing. 
Bernice clearly wanted to ask a thousand questions about that statement, but let it go. Just squeezed his hand a bit tighter, unsure if she was comforting him or herself at that moment. Bernice was immediately focused, all banter aside, as she started making a plan. Okay, so we just heard the uh, doctor and Benny have a conversation where they mention that Gallifrey is missing, and we get mm -hmm. some kind of cool moments between the doctor and Benny, and, and the doctor mentions that he doesn't travel to the uh, 27th century anymore. Mm. Yes, that was quite sweet and, 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 and touching in a way. Yeah, also, um, the doctor has has kind of sent a, um, a photo of the pyramids to Kerry using um, um, using a smartphone that can go across time in the way that phones have been doing ever since uh, Chris Reckleson's time in the TARDIS. And, and we also have a bit of kind of a FaceTime session with Kerry and, and, and Benny, then, uh, Benny then blurts out the book's title in a way that doesn't feel at all clunky because um, because uh, there'll be repercussions all across time and damage to the web of time and we will be the big bang generation or something other like, yeah clunk um. <laughs> and benny, benny's a little jealous too that she doesn't get a phone of her own yes yes yeah which i agree why doesn't benny have a phone <laughs> yeah yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, well, he's only just gone from this bloke in Houston. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're also told that 2015 is an uneventful year historically, um, which um, this book was written in 2015. And gosh, isn't that true based on what happened last year um, in both our countries? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the, uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, spot on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the calm before the storm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, the calm or the idiocy. Anyway, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> the Twelfth Doctor is described as, uh, or he's assessed, I guess, as by both Carrie and Benny as being less patient and grumpier than all of his other incarnations. And mm. they do mention that they liked the other one with the Scots accent much better. <laughs> yes. Uh, Kerry also starts looking on Gal Wiki, um, which I don't know if it's a Time Lord Wiki, <laughs> and, um, and she finds a reference to the glamour being found a hundred years before in Australia by an explorer. So yeah, basically she's Oracle from the Batman comics. She's providing galactic wiki support. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and suddenly the reference goes, showing that time is changing. Um, has Gal Wiki ever popped up before? I don't know. Um... I'm not sure. Yeah. No. No. First time I've heard of it, it was in this. <laughs> so they, they end up escaping from uh, Glob and uh, Kick, one of several times they escape from, from their clutches <laughs> in, in the book. And uh, as Peter's looking for Benny, he is like, uh, Spock-like ears. He hears the TARDIS disappearing in the distance. It's a sound he recognizes. And it mm. turns out that the Doctor and Benny travel back to December 1934, which mm. is where we get the German family going to Australia. I think he's an archaeologist. And I couldn't tell if they were Jewish. There were a couple references to them being potentially in danger in Nazi Germany, and I couldn't tell if, the, if they were one of the kind of the outgroups, and they were trying to get this rock to curry favor with the uh, kind of the occult wings of the, the Nazi party couldn't tell there my 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 understanding is that this was um this was kind of yeah i don't think that they are jewish because the but hitler isn't in charge so it's his um, predecessor whose name escapes me uh and apologies if i'm getting my german history wrong but uh, his wife's father has sent them there in case the chancellor falls and then and the and then the kind of hardcore nat see nutcases um sort of would take over and be unimpeded so he's kind of realizing things are going in a bad way and there you go go off to australia and sort it out and and just be a be away so that 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 was kind of my understanding but i at one point i was wondering whether they were supposed to be um, jewish i must say they meet up with the doctor and benny in 1934 as as the doctor benny basically tell them like point and say what you're the rock you're looking for is buried right over here yeah i feel like we got there was a missing scene there where i was really hoping to get benny's reaction to the new tardis interior i, I felt felt like there was an opportunity there for some more conversations with just the doctor and benny is particularly because they're in the tardis together 
by themselves, away from everyone else. I thought that was a bit of a missed opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, given the padding that we've had elsewhere, um, yeah, that would have been quite nice. Um, the um, the Germans also have an Aboriginal guide called Louis, who um, matches the description of the um, of, of of the gentleman that was observing the doctor earlier, so in the chinos and things. And he protests about violation of sacred lands and just disappears. Yeah, he's a trope, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, very, very similar to any number of like Native American spirit guides that you see, or yeah, oh, yeah, uncomfortable, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, my wife's Australian. Uh, I talked about um, the character of Louis with my wife, and um, she used some um, some some strong Australian language. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really. I don't. I don't know. It, it that his his character. It did. I, I did kind of. It would have been nice if we. It, it's great to have an in, indigenous Australian character. Um, it'd be nice if it wasn't a kind of spiritual, all-knowing, mysteriousy person. Yeah. Who, who vanishes while you're not looking? And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like oh, all the cliches. Yeah. Um, so, but. Anyway, yeah. the uh, <laughs> the the so the doctor Thomas and his party, who, as you mentioned, they have in addition to the Aboriginal guide Louis, they have a manservant and three workmen also. And the rock gets dropped or thrown to the ground, and it creates a a shock wave that erases much like we got last month in Engines of War, <laughs> erases the uh, manservant and the workman out of existence. So the, non, the non-speaking people all get erased. Yes, and the wife suddenly, it, it, it basically becomes Indiana Jones, uh, and the wife it's kind of turns violent. She tries to grab the rock to help restore her father's place in the party <laughs> as well. We're just like, oh, gosh, really? Okay. <laughs> So and and she in turn gets kind of uh, she doesn't get erased from history, but she just kind of she she, yeah. she is also wiped out. She's she's on the edge of the so- of the shockwave, so her yeah. erasure doesn't get isn't quite as extensive. So she blinks out of existence, but they're all able to still remember her. Whereas yeah. I think it's only the doctor who remembers the other four that were yeah. that were there earlier. Yeah. Um, they tell they tell the German to keep the rock in New South Wales because they'll need it later. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry about your uh, derang- yes. deranged Nazi wife being yes. murdered, but we got to jump back to 2015. Yes. So, so it works. The rock stays in Sydney. the The descendants create a museum and keep it there. So now yes. they so now they know where the rock is. Um, yes. They travel back to uh, Sydney and the TARDIS and join up with uh, the, Benny's gang or kind of like the Scooby gang and Buffy, I guess you'd say, or go- Glob and Kick are nearby because Peter uh, smells them. Yes. And yeah. they, they call a meeting and Benny kind of poses poses as she is wont to do as a con artist um, looking to get into Glob's gang. And uh, we get a reference to... Uh, I think it was Ace stealing an Omega device on Scaro, which is, yes, I don't know yes. if that was in reference to a book that I didn't place or or what that was in reference to, but it's an audio. I think I've not heard it, but I I did have a I did have a little look around to see what on earth all that was about. And so we we then find out that um, that yeah, because it, it's it's now, isn't it, that um, the Doctor and Benny decide to kind of break into the museum because they've managed to identify which descendant of of of, of the germans um sort of uh, has a museum and and kind of assume yeah it's going to be in there yeah ruth kind of repels down you know from the ceiling mission impossible yeah. style <laughs> to, uh, to try yes. and to, to snatch the glamour but but by yeah. that by that point they're discovered so she just um breaks the glass and alarms yes. start going off and she gets yanked up the uh the the rope and they do the yes. same they do the same trick again with the uh the knockout patches to uh yeah. to escape and render uh kick unconscious which i think is their biggest threat uh, and benny's also given the girls laxatives which was a lovely touch um, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah I, I can't remember if uh, if the scene or if it was earlier where, in order to escape, um, Peter lets out a uh, a dog. Uh, oh, yeah, the dog fart. <laughs> the dog <Yes>. fart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which was yeah. just like, oh, really? <laughs> Gross. <laughs> dear, dear, oh. it, it's. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, 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 it's like that terrible two part from Chris Eccleston's time. Oh, the the Slitheen, the yes, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Which apparently was when Lawrence Miles decided that the new version of Doctor Who wasn't quite so bad. I thought, really? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> that, that feels like a yeah. That, I was going to say most fans, I think, waited till Dalek or uh, Empty, yeah. Ch- Empty Child to make that <laughs> yes. determination. Yes. Oh. So, so uh, um, yeah. Oh, also, uh, Jack has started musing about retiring and settling down. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's ominous. They're all they're all running away from uh, mm. the heist that they just pulled off, and they decide to. Yeah. Uh, they're they've booked a hotel room in the Hotel Arcadia. Glob and Jansen or ja- Jansen follow them. Kick is still unconscious, and they decide to book a room in the hotel right next to the Summerfield Hotel Room. So they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, uh, the uh, the receptionist at the front desk wasn't respecting Australia's privacy laws. I don't think. <laughs> yes. And then we get we get a scene where uh, Ruth, Jack, and Peter are all sitting around eating pizza in their hotel room, kind of examining the glamour. We get a little yes. bit more about uh, Peter's backstory, how he was uh, in a bastion slaver pit for a year, and how his boyfriend had died there, and there were vampires involved. I'm assuming that was other audios or books. Yeah. And uh, Peter wanders off. The Benny and the Doctor arrive. Um kind of realize they don't really have a plan as to what to do next but also though we have we've been having some violent shaking so the doctor is reckoning that we might be about to kind of like run out of time and stuff um but um but thing is but they're still having the pizza just to sort of celebrate I'm like, um okay urgency folks yeah, <laughs> yeah. the um Peter, so Peter's wandered off. He's hmm. found his way to a nearby police station where he's sniffed out, kicked the assassin who had been yes. picked up there and brought uh, the local jail or drunk tank, as, yes. as it's called in, yeah. in uh, the States. And uh, yeah. Kick doesn't need help getting out. She breaks down the door. Kick and Peter have a bit of a fight in the lobby where Peter stuns all the police officers with his array of different weapons and... Uh, hmm kick breaks out and heads out on the street and Peter starts stunning bystanders in the street. And, uh, it's, it's kind of a big fight in the, in the police station and they don't realize that other cops are being, uh, called. But also, um, um, (laughs) kick, Kick has, uh, shall we say, amorous intentions towards Pete. Well, not so much amorous. She just wants to mate and have his children. Um, because she, <laughs> and, uh, despite him making it very clear that this is not on the cards, um, and uh, this, this is this is a thing that then just kind of runs throughout their scenes for the most part. Yeah, you get this undercurrent of kind of tension slash. It's a little creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's, it's, it's she's, quite she's, odd. Yeah. Kick tries to pickpocket Peter and, mm. and kind of kisses him. And uh, they, she mentions that her and Glob didn't buy that, you know, Benny were and her gang were a bunch of con artists. Um, yeah. Kick mentions that she has no intention of going back to Storm Cage and she wants to leave, uh, leave with Glob instead. Peter stuns Kick with a, with kind of a trick. She was stunned by the item that she had pickpocketed thinking it was something else mm-hmm. peter leaves the station with kind of kicks slung over his arm where she where he's confronted by swat teams in a <laughs> perimeter um yeah. he's saved by a pyramid inducing earthquake which kind of shakes <laughs> shakes everyone up and meanwhile at the same time the doctor and carrie are talking via speakerphone uh discuss, discussing uh jansen jansen and uh glob storms the room uh, having checked in next door, smashes the doctor's phone into pieces so they no longer have their 
uh, Wikipedia connection. Yes. And, uh... <laughs> Getting a visitation vibe here with the um, the sonic screwdriver and the app tools. Um, so... we, we get a one-off scene with the uh, the grandson being informed uh, from from the from the Germans that the museum called and said that uh, the uh, the glamour had been stolen, and he's excited because he wants to move to the Gold Coast, and he. He, he felt that the the museum was a burden to uh to continue to maintain and he's he's getting all excited that it was stolen and then he he, he starts feeling the earthquake as well which uh is really at this point tearing apart sydney mm. um you've got lava starting to spew everywhere you've got the harbor bridge breaking in two um it's yeah. just really chaos um jack and ruth swoop down using jack's uh jumping legs <laughs> yeah jumping powers and yes. uh he's he jumps them away from the the police perimeter seconds before the ground gives way and all the police officers get sucked into the lava and are incinerated so that happens um benny's managed to hotwire a van um or in her words acing it um and uh, so the doctor club and benny drive off to the pyramid um, whilst you've got kind of the earth cracking and lava erupting and everything, and and then then basically Jack becomes a grasshopper taxi um, for a few paragraphs, um, moving people right very close to the pyramid. I I do wonder whether we could have had more of these scenes, because um, not so much Jack jumping around, but what I mean is kind of like it, it, we could have gone a little bit more into the disaster movie. Mm, yeah, uh, I don't know because. Uh, it, it it did seem as if we all got quite neatly to the pyramid quite quickly, mm-hmm. and um, and then uh, Jack when when he's doing his final leap with Glob miscalculates and it looks like he's going to kind of fall into the boiling water, and uh, then Benny does a Batman style kind of swoop with some Gatling gun or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, right. Um, and uh, and then Louis, the indigenous Australian gentleman, reappears for a cameo and then just wanders off to wherever it is that he goes to. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, it's one of those. <laughs> yeah. We're... Uh... Yeah, they're they're trying to figure out what to do with the pyramid, and the the ancients kind of appear as these shadowy figures, and then we start getting all of universe, the universe starting to unravel, and things start morphing into different objects, or hmm. you have people turning into cockroaches, and yes. vice versa, and yeah. you have a reference to uh, Gumball Jacks and. Uh, the Duran album Medazzaland, which is where he gets the the title from. I was wondering what all those references were because, like, yeah. the, 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 there's, there is a random series of like people across time, most of whom haven't been mentioned in the book. Apparently, because um, you see a, a wedding between um, uh, an ice warrior and a human. Mm-hmm. At one point, uh, in in these very brief scenes, of w- where suddenly the, they all get turned into I don't know cockroaches or something. Um, the um, those two are um, are of companions of the Eighth Doctor in the Radio Times comic strip. Yep, which which Gary wrote. Yeah, yep. yeah. And then we get um we get a scene where everyone's where reality is kind of unraveling, and because mm. because Benny traveled with the Doctor, she's not quite immune either but she it's affecting her less quickly and yes. we get a we get a scene where she morphs into all of his previous companions so we get all the <laughs> all the different companions including cinder and uh ending with all of the audio and tv companions yes totally bypassing any ones from the books or the comics true true <laughs> <laughs> also also bypassing uh so this is set you know pre nardol because the doctor is still talking about clara yeah. but apparently the doctor doesn't include handles as one of his companions and uh <laughs> and also the doctor and rory's dad i want to say at least a few months worth of adventures you know at towards the end of power of three where yes. they're running off and doing things and then i guess he doesn't count uh his adventures with um a christmas carol 
uh, not oh, yeah. Scarlax, but uh, whatever his name was, he's not counted well, either. It's traditional for the Doctor to forget people when he has these these kind of flashback things, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, and 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 if he didn't, then then you know that section would go in even longer than it does. Yeah, um, it's it's funny too that he mentions Samson and Gemma. I think they were only in a single Doctor Who audio. They predate uh, Charlie Pollard as as Eighth Doctor companions as kind of a one off. Yeah. That's okay. yeah, a little weird. We get uh, the doctor kind of transporting through different places to he visits something that's kind of like DC Comics's War World, then into a Bandrill Ancients uh, space <laughs> conflict, then, yes. then to Ibiza. And then... <laughs> yeah, so there's an IB for nightclub that he took Jamie and Zoe to. Like, really? Where's okay. that story? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he flashes back and he gets, uh, back to 36,000 BC when the glamour first lands and that, Mm. that helps him, uh, figure out where to intercept the, the glamour before all of this happens. He gets, um... And the ancients are appearing throughout all of these scenes, but they're all kind of blurred Mm -hmm. in a sort of like a pixelated kind of way, um, (laughs) which is odd. Uh, but yes. The doctor, uh catches the he 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 basically makes everything return he convinces the convinces the ancients to uh kind of reset things or that part well, was a little yeah so um so when he's in the blue mountains um he he manages to find out from them that they drop that the ancients dropped a key while skydiving there and pretending to be gods um and uh, we then realized that the ancient who dropped the key was louis the indigenous australian gentleman uh and uh, then we have as you said we 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 have this thing where the ancients are saying yeah okay we'll fix everything yeah, um, <laughs> and the the doctor opens the TARDIS and catches the glamour as it's yes. falling to Earth, kind of meteor style. Um, so he intercepts that, and um, everything kind of returns to normal. So we get a big <laughs> a big reset button switch. Yes. Um, also, like we had last month. <laughs> yes. And uh, he returns the glamour to uh, the pyramid. Everything kind of resets itself uh benny and her gang kind of retain their memories of the Mm. encounter but carry the pack r because she was kind of remote she does not Mm. um the doctor and the tardis are returned to the white rabbit on legion where the misadventure began (laughs) Mm -hmm. and uh they everyone kind of says their goodbyes uh peter Mm. peter returns the Doctor's missing Sonic, uh, which was broken from the pink crocodile. Um, <laughs> Carrie, like we said, didn't remember helping them. Benny and the Doctor go into the TARDIS. They travel back to visit an older version of Benny, back to Legion, where mm. um, about forty miles outside of the the city, where Benny and the and her gang were were digging some time before. They ask her to stop digging and warn her not to dig up the the time mm. echo of the glamour. Mm. Um, she looks into the doctor's eyes, and that's how she's able to be convinced that it isn't a trick. Um, yeah. Once she makes the decision not to uh, dig, they kind of blink out of existence. Um, and the doctor and the future Benny do, and they blow up the dig site um, instead. The ending kind of means that they didn't end up meeting with the 12th doctor after all, except at the very end where she sees the TARDIS disappear. So that was a little confusing to me because a few paragraphs earlier said they blinked out of existence, but then she also gets the doctor leaving via TARDIS. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was kind of a confusing note to end on, but that's how uh, it it ended. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I, I kind of got the impression that Benny was that the, the, the kind of the future Benny was still with the Doctor at the end, but I was just kind of like, well, what happens to her? Because mm-hmm. I, I recently watched there's a Deep Space Nine episode, um, uh, Visionary, um, featuring uh, that that's uh, kind of very O'Brien centric, and uh, he ends up in a kind of like a time pooly 
sort of thing, uh, and it all gets very timey wimey. Um, and uh, and and at the end of that, um, uh, slight spoilers for a twenty-four-year-old uh, episode of Deep Space Nine, his future self ends up surviving, but the epi- but the character we've been watching throughout ends up dying. Okay. There's a uh, Star Trek Voyager episode that's similar too, where okay. I think Harry Kim from one timeline ends up dying, and they end up mm. taking the Harry from another timeline and they of course never mention it again. No, 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 they, they, they never mention it again. I suspect that uh, Brian is, uh, is, is a from the future version. Um, is, yeah, I do wonder how does he drop Benny back? Cause there would be two Bennies or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last month I was kind of curious to see whether river was mentioned. And of course, you know, right on the back cover, you get the quote about the archaeologist not being the one you're expecting and, and kind yeah. of we do get plenty of mentions of river and storm cage and the papal yeah. mainframe but i want a character study of river and benny kind of mm. comparing and contrasting them working side by side together or against each other because i think you could really flesh out the the similarities and differences between the two of them and i don't think that has been written yet and that no. would be something i'd really want to read no. yeah because i'm curious as to how this could have been done with with river because it because the benny flavors um do come quite to the fore with her gang because uh, like normally when you have like a high story uh you um so there's a bit of kind of tension because you're like, oh, which of these characters are going to be good? Is somebody going to betray the gang? And you don't really have that because with kind of Benny's supporting cast, you assume that nothing incredibly dramatic is going to happen um, that would have to be referenced in future audios, uh, as I was kind of alluding to earlier. But so maybe it might have been a bit more kind of heisty, um, a kind of a river version of this story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that would have played out or, or worked mm. because, you know, like you said, the elements end up using are so um, tied into the the Benny universe and what's happened before in, in those audios mm. and stuff. I'm wondering, too, with a couple of loose threads, so like the reference to the 36th century, the group studying, arguing about the glamour, and then Lou, the person who was revealed to be one of the ancients, he alluded to a few points that something was coming in the doctor's future. Mm. I, I couldn't tell if that was the third and final book in the glamor chronicles that he is referencing, or if it was the events of say like hell bent and heaven sent that he yeah. kind of knew about. It's hard to say. Cause Clara, um, Clara in this book is still con- cause she's mentioned. So the doctor remembers her. And so it's obviously kind of Clara is off kind of, you know, teaching people <laughs> at Coal Hill. Um, she, she's on a work day during this story. And that would have been really interesting too to see, you know, if Clara was in it, have mm. some scenes with her and Benny interacting. I thought, I think we that would have been mm. really interesting. It probably would have been, you know, one too many characters in what already feels like an overcrowded kind of short, yeah. short, shorter book. Yeah, I, I was thinking it, probably took place somewhere between last christmas and magician's apprentice it could Mm. have been earlier or later too but that's kind of what i was thinking in my in my head in terms of how big is the doctor's hair (laughs) (laughs) um, yeah because there's no reference to sunglasses yeah that's that's true so uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of assuming that it's yeah. I, I think you hit the nail on the head when this happens. The glamour itself, we we touched on too, is is more of a MacGuffin. They may as well called it unobtainium. Yeah, yeah. It could yeah. have been it could have been anything. It it. I felt like this was more about untangling the the mess of kind of bootstrap paradoxes uh, <laughs> that were created by the group seeking the MacGuffin. Yes. Do you want to talk about how you would rate this one? For me, oh, I'm toying. I'm toying. Okay, I'll go for I'll go for a seven. Just it's kind of borderline. I think last week's was last week's. Last last month's was was a kind of a high seven. I think this is a low seven. Um, but I mean, it's it's enjoyable. It's fun. It, it's it's a Christmas romp. Um, and yeah, uh, but. 
and there are things that could be yeah because I, I i don't necessarily get much of a feel of the characters and things but it, it's it's it, it's 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 kind of competently written it goes along at sort of a, yeah a, a bit of a pace and everything but um yeah, I, I don't like it when books hit the reset button quite as hard as this does. Uh, but when Sydney started being destroyed, uh, kind of, it was obvious to me that so like, well, it's all going to be reset. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I, probably not quite as generous <laughs> <laughs> with this one. I'm going to give this one a uh, a four out of ten. Mm. Did a good job in giving us the necessary backstory he filled in you know basic character motivations without feeling like you had to read the past 40 or so benny novels or listen to the last 50 or so audios that had come before and he provides enough hints that there are a few stories that he mentioned that i want to hear like how Mm -hmm. peter lost his boyfriend to vampiric forces in the slaver pit like i might check that one out I really liked Lisa Barman's performance in the audiobook. I enjoyed her kind of take on Capaldi. You can kind of feel the history she has with the character right from the get-go. It's just effortless. A few times in the audio, there were moments of advanced knowledge where like a a scene was set and it was raining outside, but it wouldn't mention in the scene you know, that it was raining for several pages. But you already get that detail because that's how the scene started. I'm not sure if I'm yeah. kind of a fan of that sort of foreknowledge or not, but um, it happened enough in the audio where it was remarkable. Um, I liked the idea behind the book that the crossover between Benny and the 12th Doctor era, like I said, I would have liked to have seen her interact with Clara or River or have gotten some of her reactions to the TARDIS interior. Um, I felt there were a lot of opportunities that were missed for uh, kind of cool moments. Mm. Yeah, you've convinced me. Six. <laughs> okay. It's a six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I listened to like the first chapter something like five times just because I wanted to. It was so confusing, and that was where I kind of flipped back and forth between the book and the and the audio the most. It kind of felt like playing with like Russian nesting dolls, where you mm. you're watching someone work their way out of backwards out of a maze that they had constructed or a video game level they had designed. It just wasn't super interesting in that respect to me. And then the ending, like you had mentioned, with the reset button being right out of the TV movie, or Mm -hmm. Engines of War, or Journey to the Center of the TARDIS, where it's an actual reset button. (laughs) Um, I I have to say I'm really, really looking forward to when we eventually get a a straightforward base under siege type story (laughs) to Mm -hmm. read that doesn't end with a end with a reset button yes i did enjoy all of the uh descriptions of australia and the Mm. the detail the characterization Mm. of lou like you mentioned was somewhat problematic (laughs) (laughs) the planetary gimmicks for uh legion and aztec moon too similar and kind of too confusing um I'm a bit of a an astronomy buff. So, you know, when I read that Legion had a light dark terminus and Aztec Moon had a damp side dry side, it's an interesting concept. Um the seven planets that were recently discovered around the the Trappist system about 40 light years from Earth, uh all of those are thought to be tidally locked with their sun which is a red dwarf, meaning that one side of the planet's always facing the sun and would get really hot and the other side facing way would get really cold. But there could be life along the strip running vertically around the planet in a very narrow habitable zone called the planetary terminus. And if you found yourself living there, you'd experience perpetual sunrise or sunset. Like yeah. the sun would never stop setting, which would be really cool. But we don't get any details like that in his description of of either of the planets. So to me, again, that was kind of a bit of a wasted opportunity. So overall... I think Gary's great. Love his contributions mm-hmm. to the Doctor Who universe. Um, this one, unfortunately, not my not my favorite. I, I think for me, possibly my mark was was might have been lifted by the Aussie stuff, uh, just because I just because I spent time out there and 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 I could tell. Yeah, he clearly had spent time there as well, because uh, I mean, you know, quite a few of those observations. Yeah. 
are ones that, yeah that I've kind of made similar stuff to. I've not spent anywhere near as much time in Sydney as he has, but but yeah. So um, so it was. It, I, I I think that that kind of like local touch helped um, uh, for me. Local knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and, and the Blue Mountains uh, are a fantastic place and so if uh, as it says in the the back of the book uh, if anybody gets a chance to go and see it because um the free sisters which is this rock formation that the glamour crashes into those are real uh, and uh, whilst i've not actually been to those um, there are many spectacular weird rock formations out in the australian kind of um you know wildernessy bits and stuff do you happen to know what the um there was a reference to the tunguska event Mm. which was the meteor in Siberia and like, the, yeah. do you know, and it was the doctor and Benny involved in that. Do you know what that was a reference to? Just something I didn't catch. I don't know because, um, because the doctor and Liz Shaw were there in the, one of the, in the, one of the David McKinty books. And I can't remember which, yeah, I, I, I don't know which, which, um, we yeah, have where the Benny references from it. One final just little continuity thing that I didn't realize, but I, f- I found out later was uh, this book solves uh, multiple continuity issues with <laughs> with, uh, with Professor Arthur Candy. So Professor Candy works at Luna University, and he f- okay. he first appeared in Stephen Moffat's Continuity Errors, which was the short story for Decalogue Three, yes. uh, and that's set in twenty six forty three. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Professor Candy also shows up in the Oh No It Isn't audio uh, nearly 50 years earlier. Right. But then in the TV series, uh, River meets up with Professor Candy in the 52nd century on uh, the Luna University. And I guess there's a <laughs> reference to him in uh, one of the, the video game tie-ins that came out okay. too. So, okay. so Gary solves this in the book by... Uh, referencing that Professor Candy has multiple clones uh, over time, <laughs> not unlike uh, Cylons or... Uh, okay. Um, I was thinking of, like, Patton Oswald's character on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Hank and Dean Venture in The Venture Brothers. It was one of those references that I looked up and I was like, oh, I had no idea that uh, Professor Candy was a thing that needed that needed solving. Yeah, I, I I must say that, ref- that entire reference had just totally passed me by. Uh, I didn't realize that um, the the kind of the Moffat era, etc., had had its own uh, unit dating controversy um, <laughs> type thing. So yeah, right. All right. Anything else you want to say about uh, this book? I think we've talked about it almost as long as the uh... the audio. <laughs> it's always nice to see band rules rocking up. Um, I'm just saying that of all of the species is on the other spaceship. Yeah. They mentioned the bandrels? Okay, right. Yes. If you don't know what bandrel is, I would say go and watch Time Lash, but uh, yeah, maybe don't go and watch Time Lash. Go read the target novelization of it instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have some listener mail and some feedback to ah, share. Oh, cool. So last month, uh, it turns out we missed some stuff that uh, George Mann has done. George has written for Titan Comics, including Mm -hmm. uh, the Eighth Doctor miniseries and Supremacy of the Cybermen. He's also written audiobooks for the uh, Twelfth Doctor, uh, Mm -hmm. two of the Winter audio miniseries, and two of the the Lost miniseries. So like, yeah, I guess there's eight or so Doctor audios that are out. Um, oh, okay. He also wrote one of the Trenzalor tales, which it turns out I mm. actually read <laughs> um, about uh, crinoids attacking uh, the Trenzalor colony. And um, incidentally, uh, Tales from Trenzalor, I think, would make a good December book mm. for future Christmases, uh, yes. as would uh, The Twelve Doctors of Christmas. And I think Big Finish mm-hmm. has some uh, short trip Christmas collections so we don't have any email yet but we do have some tweets and some feedback to share so we've got ian on twitter asked us if the uh, podcast is being carried on itunes it is Mm -hmm. and he thought it was awesome that it was starting back up again he wanted to know if we were going to review saint anthony's fire at some point um which we had talked about previously. Yes. We, we will be getting to that one eventually along yeah. with uh, Christmas on a rational planet. So mm-hmm. thank you, Ian, for that. 
Uh, Josh from the Oncoming Storm podcast sent us a message wish- wishing us uh, luck in our podcast endeavor, and he says he appreciates the work we're doing, putting into it. Cool. Good. Thank you. Sean from uh, the TARDIS Tavern and other podcasts <laughs> um, <laughs> thanked us for taking up the gauntlet. Uh, I'm not sure if that means we have to have a duel now or not. <laughs> he, uh, he's also glad that we uh, filled this niche and were that we're expanding uh, the remit beyond the four ranges covered in the original version of the podcast. So yeah. thank you, Sean, for your kind comments. Steven from uh, Radio Free Scaro gave us a shout oh, out. Awesome. <laughs> uh, he gave us a shout out at the end of one of their recent uh, Gallifrey episodes at the end of uh, episode 570, I think. So thank you very much, uh, Radio Free Scaro and Steven for, for doing that. We appreciate it. Mm. And then uh, two more little tweets. Uh, Ken from Twitter commented as he was listening to the first episode that the uh, Pertwee plaque that we were talking yes. about, um, he had mentioned that w- that was only unveiled just last year. And he said that there was an event at the theater with a few guests. Um, okay. I'm not sure who attended, but he said he was able to get some of his uh, DVDs signed at the event. Mm. So that's pretty cool. Oh, cool. Cool. And then uh, A.M. Moore from Twitter says nice work chaps he enjoyed the first episode <laughs> and he's looking forward to many many more <laughs> cool cool so that brings us on to what we're going to be doing next yes so do you want uh, to tell the lovely folks at home sure so next month our pick was made by one of our listeners who <laughs> we will hopefully will be joining us for our may podcast uh, we haven't done an 11th doctor story yet and the person mm-hmm. who selected this book will probably be very familiar to the listeners of the book club podcast. <laughs> so uh, so be sure to tune in next month to find out who that is. Yes. Um, we'll be reading an 11th Doctor Amy and Rory novel called uh, The Silent Stars Go By, which mm-hmm. is written by Dan Abnett. I think of it as having just come out, but then I, uh, <laughs> I uh, checked the publication date, and it was published in September of 2011, so it's almost six years old already. Um, yeah. Time really does fly. It was, uh, it, was issued, it was reissued in 2013 in paperback for the 50th anniversary uh, range with a different cover. Um, I'm flipping through the, the book now, and it turns out it's dedicated to, uh, to George Mann. So funny how oh! things come full circle. <laughs> yes. Ooh, <laughs> um, yes. There's also an unabridged audio version, uh, about six hours long, read by Michael Maloney, who I guess has done some voice work for Big Finish and some other BBC yeah. audios. And we should mention, too, that with this book selection, it might be a nice uh, tie-in with some of the baddies in, mm. uh, in the novel will be on the uh, current season of the television show, which will yes. be starting this weekend. Mm. So uh, that's The Silent Stars Go By, an 11th Doctor book by Dan Abnett for the mm-hmm. uh, for the May 2017 selection. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, until next month, uh, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Um, happy reading. <laughs> <laughs> For listening to the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. You can contact the show and follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast. Our music is the Doctor Who theme, Swing Jazz Version by George C. Music, used with attribution under Creative Commons license. Until next month, happy reading. Thank you.